it's a great pleasure uh, for me, as it is for all of you, to be here uh, <laughs> experiencing the, the, the fantastic intellectual provocation, engagement with serious world issues, and of course, friendship and hospitality that we've come to know from Wolf and His Serene Highness. Uh, I've been struggling to think, what could I say about crisis diplomacy? We've spent 20 years, 10 years with the Institute, but overall 20 years running around different parts of the globe, thinking about questions affecting different parts of the world. Uh, we've looked at the Western Balkans, we've looked at the Caucasus, we've looked at South Asia, the wider Middle East, including Iran. Uh, what on earth is there to say about this 20 years uh, that can possibly be said in less than 10 minutes? Uh, and then I thought about it, and I thought the greatest example of crisis diplomacy uh, surrounding the Institute through that whole period came about three, four years ago at one of London's finest restaurants <laughs> when His Serene Highness and Wolf were there, we were having dinner, uh, and Wolfgang in his usual exuberant way was opening a bottle of sparkling water. I did hope to have one around, but there's no bottle of sparkling water here. Opened it, sprayed it across the next table, uh, and the man at the next table stood up and he was about to throw down the gauntlet and take Wolf outside for a duel, but Wolf with great aplomb just stood there and was very diplomatic. The epitome of the great diplomat solving a, a real crisis, the most immediate <laughs> crisis that we've known in the whole time. Uh, and on that note, I probably should finish. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll say three other things. Uh, and, and that's... And that's just to throw out th thoughts on three things that I think have straddled this period. Uh, the first of those is pictures, and which affect and have changed the way in which diplomacy, crisis diplomacy, engagement with the problems of the world are being thought about and, and being dealt with. Uh, and that's why I missed my lunch and spent my time uh, just putting together some pictures. If it, Danny? Take that. This one? Yep, I'm going to do that one. Right? So, so yeah. Just pictures. Uh, pictures will be familiar, some not so familiar, but you know what they are. You don't need really to think about them. But things which have affected decisively, one way or another, the shape uh, of the events with which we've been engaged over this past uh, decade. They've been the impetus for engagement in action. They've been evidence <coughs> surrounding events. And in many ways, they've come to be the decisive elements, particularly in engagements surrounding the use of force, uh, in defining the outcome. No longer a world where a decisive battle at a center of gravity will shape an outcome, but it's actually the images. And if it's, I think it's fair to say that if the adventure in Iraq had not been lost by the time the images of Abu Ghraib came out, certainly it was never going to be winnable from that point onwards. And so this is something which has shaped our world in ways which we probably couldn't have imagined at the start of that 20-year period because the growth in global communications, the way in which digital digitization of imagery and other forms of communication have reshaped the world and have changed those pressures. Um, of course, the sad thing is that mostly those focus, uh, the, the images that work most certainly focus on my second theme, which is war crimes. Uh, the period has been dominated not only by the images of atrocity, by the attempts to deal with atrocity, but also by a competition, I think, in the end, between uh, the attempts to prosecute and the attempts to promote peace and security. There is a theory, there was a theory, people are now reflecting on this, that you can use the instruments of justice to help resolve cri uh, crises, conflicts, to bring things to a resolution. But I think, uh, and, vi and the visual material is, is so salient in that, both in prompting the decisions to take action, in providing evidence, we saw the images of, of mass graves there, uh, and also uh, in terms of, of reaching out beyond any prosecution into the realm of peace and security. But the evidence of this 20 a year almost experiment, I think, uh, has to be called into question. It's a lot harder to make things work the way you want them to in practice uh, than it is to think through how a theory might work in principle. Uh, the theory of connecting justice to peace, 
i.e. you promote justice, you have international criminal bodies to deal with these issues, uh, bring people uh, into courtrooms, make them face trial, seems like a good one. You create an accountable record. But in fact, if only we went back to the record of the first major international military tribunal at Nuremberg, the message of the time is not the message that we've, we, we've received down through history. And I think we can see the same thing working out in practice through the events of the last 20 years. There is a disconnect between the success of prosecutions, and I look to the Yugoslavia Tribunal where I was involved for a number of years, uh, 161 indictments, 159 cases either already dealt with or in the process of being dealt with, uh, but actually no sense of success whatsoever beyond the courtroom. No connection with the people who were supposed to be the beneficiaries in terms of peace and security on the ground in the region. And the same is true in Rwanda, the same is true in Sierra Leone. So we have to question. Uh, but at the same time, we have no alternative but to continue. So we will have long drawn out prosecutions that in the end fail because people are acquitted because they're supposed to be proven guilty. The trouble with fair trials is it might not work out that they're proven guilty, uh, or they die. People get the sense that nothing is working. Or, of course, among those 159 great successes, we have the third, a third of them or so uh, through forcible detention operations, but even they can go wrong. Uh, those of you who know the SAS, the great British Special Forces, uh, on this Veterans Day occasion, we, we have Remembrance Day through till Sunday, so I'm keeping wearing my poppy. Uh, <coughs> well, no, you can. Uh, even the best can get it wrong sometimes. The motto of the, of the SAS, who dares wins. The motto here, who dares twins. Because <laughs> by chance, one village in Bosnia had two sets of identical twins, and they got the wrong pair. Uh, it's not as easy in practice as you think it might be. Uh, and that takes me on to the final point, which has run through this period and that's the question of political will uh, and also legitimacy. But given that legitimacy had both an airing and a trashing this morning, I'm going to shy away from that part of it right now. Uh, and that's the sense that <coughs> I, I, I have wrote a book. If anybody knows I've done anything, this is the thing they know. I've done the triumph of the lack of will about <laughs> international diplomacy and the Yugoslav crisis in the 1990s. And that was about the struggle to get people to face up to realities and to do those things which could be done. Uh, one of the difficulties of persuading people that things can be done, where there's a will uh, and a way going together, is that sometimes then they get carried away. Well, not the very same people, but the idea gets carried down. Uh, and maybe through Iraq and Kosovo in the 2000s, we've had too much political will uh, and not enough leavening uh, by, by a sense of the realities and the circumstances. And that's the kind of thing which I think is feeding through now into a very dismal, somewhat negative sense that's going to affect the NATO summit next week. Uh, there'll be a new NATO strategic concept, which in a sense will be a kind of retrenchment, a refo refocusing around the traditional, supposedly core NATO mission of defense, albeit in a modernized form, taking into account new issues like cybersecurity. But it's moving backwards. It's the sense of having been chastened by the political experiences of Iraq, even though the alliance wasn't directly involved, and, Afg and of Afghanistan. Uh, and one of the sad ironies in all of this is that where the negative and the visual have a decisive effect, the positive is hard to identify because it rarely has that visual element to go with it. Uh, this is a sign of something positive, by the way, just <laughs> to show that you can find odd, odd examples but it doesn't hit people in the same way as those negative things do. Uh, at the moment, we've had a set of operations in Afghanistan over the course of, since the spring this year, most of this year, uh, which, with a couple of exceptions, have been going extremely well. There is a very good story to be told. And yet, the understanding among the political circles, certainly in London, where we've just had a new national security and uh, strategic and secu security and strategic defense review, a new document, is the sense that this is a lost cause. And the people are not getting the message that actually things are working. And we're probably going to walk away from something where there's a chance of success. And I think get the very strong sense that the same thing is affecting the United States as well. Because we can't get that positive picture that will say, we're doing well, here's a success. 
So with all of this, we've had a rise and a fall over 10 years. Uh, crisis affected by the financial crash, affected by the weariness and the tiredness of trying to deal with these things, and yet a, a set of continuing questions and a set of new questions that will come. We know them well, some of them. We've discussed them well, like Iran, Sudan in the Institute. We haven't discussed so much, but maybe in the year ahead, you should be, not just tomorrow, but yeah, over the months ahead, there should be serious engagement there. Afghanistan, a lot of time, a lot of attention to those self-determinations, political constitutional questions, which are actually vital to defi defining that successful outcome in Afghanistan, but keep getting overlooked time and time again by the politicians in, in Washington, London, Brussels, and elsewhere. Uh, and of course, finally, I, I, I'm gonna have to say Kosovo I wanted to talk about, but as it went this morning, I didn't, but there's a need for, for, for continuing engagement there, but with a new perspective. Uh, and that's for the EU to set out and really kind of invent something like a free territory to help us all get through it. So on all of that, one final positive image to finish, the peace and tranquility of Lake Como. Uh, Andy Morovchik isn't here, but that's the last time he talked to me properly, so I thought I'd put that up just as a... <laughs> <laughs>